भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय in my F150 this is wisdom of the sages a daily yoga podcast with your host raganath and co-host and senior educator at the bhakti center in new york kastuba das welcome to the show welcome everyone to tuesday um sorry for the slow introduction today we went we had that save a weekend and then we just took off and went camping found these great waterfalls got all the kids had the worst sleep of my life cuz my my six-year-old sleeping with my six-year-old is like sleeping with a break dancer it's just like kicking chopping smacking so then uh i went to the truck and for some reason i have a weak signal today i'm gonna try to make this happen please forgive me how are you guys oh no is frozen now now it's costuba frozen how could he? He's in New York. He's the. It's the land of 5G. Oh, Lori man. Pag's there. She's moving around. Okay. Yeah. See, she's okay. Okay. Hey, I'm 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 I'm, hor I'm vertical. Is that okay, or should I be horizontal like this? Oh, there we go. I think horizontal might be the way. Horizontal looks better. That Kostu is back. I'm back. Kostuba, right? You know my right? my uh, internet has been sketchy recently. How is that happening in New York? That's the land of good internet. Well, we are in a good place in the Bhagavatam. If you're new to the show, it's usually a little bit tighter than this, a little bit more professional. I'm usually not in Brattleboro High School parking lot, but that's where it's going to happen today for me. Um, and Kastuba is going to read uh, where we are. You, you want, should we just jump right into the Bhagavatam today, or do we have any messages? Um, it's getting late. Why don't we just jump right into the bar with time? Let's, let's jump in. Okay. Well, one thing we could say is we're, we're going to bring back Goramani. Goramani. Uh, we're going to do like a Bhagavad Gita workshop for our Patreon members, right? And she's sharp like anything. She's yeah. not just a great singer. I tell you, we got tens of thousands of people watch that show. I know. It's like 25,000 or something now. It was like our biggest show we ever did with Goramani. And she was... And she was really right on. I'm ready to put Mara on that Goramani tour bus. You can see she's becoming like a big guru in India, right? It's like she's got like thousands of people. Like, cause you see when she yeah. speaks, she's got power, you know? She's, got, she's a powerful speaker. It, it's one of those things we were reading yesterday. The power of disciplic succession. Yeah. It's yeah. not like if I, if I go up to Kostuba and say, Kostuba, great class. His natural response will be, well, I have great teachers. He's not taking the credit. And this is, this is a problem, I feel like, in the yoga community. It hasn't, like, figured that out, that this is a traditional way to hear yogic knowledge. What happens in the West truly is uh, we, we hear stuff, and then we sort of make it our own stuff, and it just becomes our whole bag of tricks. In traditional yoga culture, you never – own the stuff, the information, the wisdom, the techniques as your own, because they're not ours. They're basically given to us. And, um, and then we become empowered by a tradition that's actually living through our body for, you know, for, for masters uh, from the previous, uh, for, for generations before us. So Goramani, when she speaks so powerfully, it's, she's got like the uh, lineage speaking behind her. Truthfully, everybody on Wisdom of the Sages when they speak on this stuff, it's not even them speaking anymore. They're just sort of repeating what they heard. And one thing I always do, because to, to indemnify myself, like when I, when I give a Bhagavatam class or say a yoga class, but maybe some philosophy, I'll say something like, you know, the sages of ancient India say, you're not the body. Or I'll give a class and I'll, I'll say, you know, hey, um, you might think uh, that was a great class. It's not because I'm a great teacher. It's because this is just yoga philosophy. It's not my stuff. I, I'm, not, I'm not getting any kickback from it. It's not my stuff. And if you don't like the class, I'm not offended. It's not my, I'm a yoga teacher. My job is just to teach yoga. 
And when I say that, it sort of indemnifies me from people liking it or not liking it. Right. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah like it's like the where the, where you, the job is to be like the mailman, that you deliver it, right? You don't mess with yeah. it. You I can't get it. mad at the mailman for the package he delivers me. <laughs> you deliver it. <laughs> yeah. And then you so don't anyway. take any credit. And that way you, you, you actually stay humble and stay situated in reality rather than in some ridiculous kind of egoistic conception that we're so prone to absorb even yeah. the name of yoga or spirituality or whatever. So she gets oh, that. She gets that. Yeah, she right? gets it. And, yeah. and you know, the beautiful thing is she's big, like bigger than life. And you can, a lot of people have that thing where they're, they're big, they're big, they, they're, they're leaders, but they feel like, well, I don't want to be a leader. I don't want to step into bigger shoes. I want to be humble. I, I, mean, I think spirituality is supposed to be humble. Not necessarily. If you have that karma where you're meant to do big things in this world, it's time to step into that. It's time to step into those shoes because, uh, and you can do it in a humble way. You just do it without the ego. Mm. That's all. All right. That's okay. All. Ready to dive in? Yes. Here's chant our prayers. Shirley. Let's chant our secret mantras. Say your prayers. No, no, <laughs> Say no, your prayers, no, rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows our jokes. That's too old. <laughs> We're too old now. Narayanam namaskritya naram chayva narotamam devim saraswatim vyasam tato jayamuti raye. Before you start in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, one should first offer obeisances to the Supreme Lord Narayan. Unto Nara Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being. Unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning. And to Srila Vyasadeva, the author. Nasta Prayeshva Badrishu Nityam Bhagavat Sevaya. Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtaki. By regular attendance in classes in the Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart will become completely eradicated in loving service to the personality of Godhead, who is praised with transcendental songs, will be established as an irrevocable fact. Om Ajnana Tamarandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chakshurun Manatam Yena Tasma Shri Gudave Namaha so we're reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Pandavas retired timely. This is the first canto, chapter 15, Kostum? Chapter 15. And okay. uh, we are going to read today from beginning from text 41. Uh, okay, we, great. And you're yeah, going to do the reading because I'll I don't do have my book here. No problem. No problem. Uh, so yesterday we read about now, now Yudhishthir is ready to retire. He's leaving it all behind. He took, he relinquished all his royal garments belts, ornaments. Yes. And Ro Scepters. now Rogonoff is gonna break out his metal detector and go searching for those. By the way, I've got a lot of I've got a lot of traction with them when I started mentioning metal detectors. You don't believe how many people are into metal detecting the student. People writing you emails and stuff? No, people writing me notes on the side. Hey, I heard your no. thing about metal detecting. I'm totally into it. <laughs> some places it's completely one I found out yesterday, some people in Sweden said it's completely illegal to to metal detect in certain countries. Yeah, you can't steal that stuff. That's why the British Empire fell. They took all those jewels from India. You know that? That's a whole other story. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's, that's the that's they say the curse of the Brahmins for stealing the jewels. They stole the jewels from the temples in India. Okay. Any case, yeah. let's let's not get into that. So, um, so yeah, so Yudhishthir, he's he's externally cutting off from all of the the external kind of identity through the royal dress. Now yes. we're gonna to start to talk about the internal, okay? The, on the more subtle level, right. he's gonna to start to relinquish everything, right? A, a, good, a, a good point, because the external, we can give up the garments, but we mm -hmm. still have to deal with all our, our mind, our ego. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So right, this is gonna sound you, a little far this. out. I'm gonna read two verses, okay? And then we'll talk about them and read some from the commentaries. Text 40 says, Maharaj Yudhishthira at once, oh no, that's, that's what we read, text 41. Then he amalgamated all the sense organs into the mind. Then what? the mind into the life. That means like the prana. Yeah. Life into breathing his total existence into the embodiment of the five elements what? And, his, and his body into death. Then as pure self, 
he became free from the material conception of life. Text 42. Thus annihilating the gross body of five elements into the three qualitative modes of material nature, he merged them in one nescience and then absorbed that nescience in the self, Brahman, which is inexhaustible in all circumstances. All right, you got that, Raghunath? That's it. That made do that no first right now. That makes no <laughs> sense to me whatsoever, but... I'm ready for that purport or explanation by Kosuba Das. Uh, well, it's not, it's not me, rather, not this, these great teachers that we have, but Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, a very important commentator on, on, uh, on Bhagavatam, he, he, he mentions it like this, that he offered all the senses into the mind because the senses are dependent on the mind, right? Like, the senses are just these extensions of the mind. It's how the mind pulls in its information, right? So he mm. offers the senses, hey, these, my, dear mind, the senses don't belong to me. They belong to you. You take them. They belong to you, right? So he offered all the senses into the mind because the senses are dependent on the mind. He offered the mind into the prana because the mind is dependent on the prana. Right, these these subtle life airs, the mind exists on the basis of them somehow. And people that know a lot about Ayurveda and th they, they can go more into this kind of stuff. I don't know so much about it. He gave the mind to the prana. Oh, mind, I have given the senses to you. They are yours. I have no use for them now. This is the contemplation. So he's just like we tend to identify entirely with the body. And he's going through a mental process where he's relinquishing the sense of ownership, even to his own senses, even to his own um, mind, even to his, you know, it, it, and, and ultimately to the own body, which is made up of five elements, earth, water, fire, mm -hmm. earth, and ether. And he takes the, the components of his body and he offers them into the, the three modes of material nature. And all of that is all ultimately offered to God like that. So let's read a little from the commentaries of Prabhupada writes. He writes, Maharaj Yudhishthir, like his brother Arjuna, because we heard earlier how Arjuna just focused his mind entirely on the, the teachings of Bhagavad Gita and he became absorbed in the lotus feet of Krishna. So it says, Maharaj Yudhishthir, like his brother Arjuna, began to concentrate and gradually became freed from all material bondage. First, he concentrated all the actions of the senses and amalgamated them into the mind. Or in other words... And now this is the way Prabhupada explains it. You ready? Yeah. He says, or in other words, he turned his mind toward the transcendental service of the Lord. He prayed that since all material activities performed by the mind in terms of actions and reactions of the material senses, and I'm sorry, he prayed that since all material activities are performed by the mind in terms of actions and reactions of the material senses, and since he was going back to Godhead, the mind would wind up its material activities and be turned towards the transcendental service of the Lord. There was no longer a need for material activities, right? His grandson was now the king. He was going to take care of the responsibilities. There's no need for me to be engaged in any material activity. Then Prabhupada says, actually, the activities of the mind cannot be stopped, for they are a reflection of the eternal soul. But the quality of the activities can be changed from matter to the transcendental service of the Lord. Okay. And then he um, he goes on later in the in, in the commentary in text forty two. He says it is due to the living entity's forgetfulness of their eternal nature as eternal servitor of the Lord, and their false conception of being a so called Lord of this material nature that they are obliged to enter into the existence of false sense enjoyment. You got that? No? Of sorts. Of, of sorts. Of sorts. It's saying that <laughs> the, 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 the way that, you know, that the material, that the three modes of material nature manifest, as, you know, in these five elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, taking the shape of the body, taking the shape of the mind, taking the shape of the senses, and then the soul being placed within that temporary, constantly shifting package. 
Sure. Why does that happen? Prabhupada says it is due to the living entity's forgetfulness of their eternal nature as a servitor of the Lord. Instead of saying, I am the leaf to the tree and I'm happy that way. Right. What is it like to be the tree? <laughs> right? And we forget our position. And then, okay, if that's what you want, you can enter into the virtual reality and take on the virtual five elements and the virtual mind and the virtual senses and move around a world of virtual sense objects. And so it says, then you become obliged to enter into the existence of false sense enjoyment. That's the virtual reality that we're all moving through. Mm. This, thus a concomitant, now this is, a, he says, thus a concomitant generation of material energies is the principal cause of the minds being materially affected. When we disconnect ourselves from God, then there's a generation of material energy. It starts to move in such a way to facilitate our mind, right? Our, 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 our desire. Um, take shape in a particular form, in a particular body, in a particular place, like that. So he uses this word generation. Thus, a concomitant generation of material energies is the principal cause of the minds being materially affected. Thus, the gross body of five elements is produced, right? It's built around our desire. Um, gotcha. Okay, then, then he says, Maharaj Yudhishthir, reverse the action. Okay, we enter into the material realm and it's all being developed according to our desire and you get a body and you get a mind and you get the senses and, and all this. It's, it's all generated. He uses that word generated. Like when something's generated, it goes through the first stage, second stage, third stage. Now Yudhishthir is going backwards and he's taking mm. all of those subtle material things, gross material things, and he's just kind of, He's kind of disassociating himself with it all and entirely okay. associating here, with his service. Because we don't hear this stuff so often, mm -hmm. are we supposed – here's the idea. Are we supposed to be doing this at our time of dissolution, so to speak, or is it just happening naturally? Or does Maharaj have some insider info that we don't know about and that it, think, will, it will come to us or, you know – the, the way that I understand it, and, and, and you know, I can't pose as I really understand exactly what, how this, what this looks like. Is he sitting down silently and, you know, for, for days at a time and making this? I don't really understand that, you know. This sounds like the work of a, of a person who's advanced in yoga, right? And, it, like, and when I say that, and, and the ability to sit still, to go very deep within. And, and, and also, and this, going is, through steps. this is... This isn't how he died either. This is like no, he's not. Like he's he's, 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 not, he's dying. not dying. He's just later. sort of disassociating. That's right. So we heard externally how he disassociated, but he he took off all the royal garb and he wrapped just like a, a loincloth, right? Yeah. But now he's doing that on some kind of deep yogic internal level. Now we may not be able to do exactly what he's doing. We may not understand exactly what he's doing. Someone like Yogi Chiru, he's probably got even like a better idea of what's going on here, right? Because he's like, yeah, he goes within and he he does this kind of stuff. But most of us are not very competent, you know, in that way. But what we do is the essence of it, right? Is we say, dear God, my senses they're meant for you. These sense objects are not meant for me. They're meant for you, right? And so I let go of them. And my senses, they're not meant for me to try to suck some enjoyment out of this material energy. They're meant yeah. to be engaged in your service. I use my eyes in your service. I use my ears in your service. I use my voice in your service. I use my hands in your service. I offer them all to you. Mm. So, so um, now... That's what we should be doing all the time. Now, now what he's doing is he's retiring. So even more so, like, whereas, like, say we, we have a particular occupation and, a, and certain duties in life, and we use our senses in those, then you could come to a stage of life where you say, I don't even use my body and my mind in that anymore. It's entirely for God now, right? Like, at a later stage in life, if we could retire and do that, right? Rather than, and sorry, um, right. Who's our friend? Who's the golfer? Uh, oh, uh, his, his name is Levon. Rich, Man, Man, Rich Mancusco. Rich, Rich Mancusco. Man yeah. But but we're saying that rather in retirement, rather than using my my body, my senses to play golf. No offense to the golfers out there. 
but uh, we, we would say my mind and my senses and my body are now 100% entirely, directly given to you. Mm. Okay. So that's how I would understand that we would kind of do what Yudhishthira is doing right here. Something like that, if I understand it correctly. Now, Prabhupada goes on. He says, so he says, thus the gross body of five elements is produced. Maharaj Yudhishthira reversed the action. Okay, that generation that, 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 that happens when we enter into a material body, he's reversing it right now. And so Maharaj Yudhishthira reversed the action and merged the five elements of the body into the three modes of material nature. The qualitative distinction of the body as being, this is really interesting, are you ready now? That's speaking a whole different language. I don't understand any of this. I th I, did you hear anything I just said? Or are you just were yeah. you dissatisfied with it? Or were you? Yeah, it's just, it's, okay, go on. So, so, now, now, at least theoretically, we could understand that he was able to mentally, you know, internally disassociate himself uh, from, I get that. I get okay. that. Okay. It, now, now, Prabhupada makes a really interesting sentence. It gives shares a sentence right here. The qualitative distinction of the body as being good, bad, or mediocre hmm. is extinguished. Is extinguished. Right. In like other it has words, has nothing to do with us. Is I don't identify with it. Now, now, now think yeah. about this. Think about the freedom in this. Right. That. We generally are very um, stuck in a bodily conception. We identify with the body. I'm a man. I'm a woman. I am, you know, uh, you know, whatever nationality and from whatever place. And I'm attractive. I'm unattractive. I'm intelligent. I'm not so intelligent. I'm strong. I'm, fit. I'm, I'm, not, I'm out of shape. Yeah. yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm, out, of, I'm out of shape. I hate I'm, my I'm fit. I hate my haircut. You know, stuff like hair. that. No, no, it sounds crazy, but we're stuck with that and we run with it and it becomes our identity and our, I mean, uh, like um, right now my wife sprained her ankle. So she's, her whole thing is my ankle, my ankle. Right. The consciousness uh, and, goes and, there. Yeah. So, so, so not only do we identify with the body, we are quite frankly, we're all running around being tortured by this stuff. You know. Tortured or elated, which will become torture soon enough. Then that's, that's the point. Even if we're elated, then it, be, it goes to torture eventually, right? Even if I'm real fit now, well, at a certain point, I'm not going to be. Right? Well, there's a lot of people who were fit and they got into bodybuilding and then they stop bodybuilding and their body just becomes huge. You know what I mean? It's, it, <laughs> One way or another. It, they they got to maintain it. But it was another thing is that people are obsessed with their hair and they, men especially, and they get this male pattern balding. They lose their mind. They get plugs put in their hair. It, it, it because they're so. The identity. Is our, so wor it. our worth is in our package. Public and and it's almost it's like sometimes. Uh, have you ever like? Well, you have. <laughs> I was gonna say if you've ever shaved your head, mm -hmm. it's like a liberating feeling. And if a woman's ever shaved their head, they probably feel even more liberated. I know my wife a couple times shaved her head. And it's even more liberating because we put so much emphasis on our appearance and on our hair and how, how that's our identity. And to just yeah. let go yeah. and sort of be like, you know, I don't care. No hair. Who cares? <laughs> when long hair it requires a lot of upkeep, right? It's like ladies know. The whole it's like, thing it's, does. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy. Whole, it's so, just so, to be in the game or in the matrix of, you know, even fitness. Do people actually want to be fit? because they want to use their body of service or do they just want, are we being fit for somebody else or for the public opinion? Yeah. In, uh, what do people think of my body? I got to start working on my abs. My abs are not, um, you know, well, so, we get. Well, yeah. I mean, right. It's like my, ab, like I need a certain definition. Why do you need abs? abs to be able to feel good what about you, myself? What are you lifting today? What do you got? You're a, a furniture mover. <laughs> so, so, so again, this, this sentence by Prabhupada says, the qualitative distinction of the body as being good, bad, or mediocre is extinguished when one is doing this, right? Now, now, now think about this. Like, for instance, you know, and, and I'm going to speak a little, uh, you know, a little bit on the, um, I don't know, sociolo sociological level or something like that. But yeah. it, gen generally, like, 
there, I know there's statements out there. I, I'm not going to say that this is right or wrong, but people do studies and, and so on. But it seems to make sense that when women are feeling a sense of, of uh, lacking a, a, a sense of self-worth, that a lot of times that, that, um, that feeling turns, they turn it in on themselves. And when men are feeling it, they turn it out towards the world. Right? What do you mean? What do you like mean? women, they're, they're, they're in, if, if I feel I'm ugly, I'm fat, I'm this or that, I'm not worthy. Right. Then, then they turn that t- type of self-hatred inward and they harm themselves in different ways. Huh. And you're saying men. Whereas men, men they turn that out the to the world and they harm the world. Yeah. You know, that's like, you Interesting. know, what we call toxic masculinity or, you know, things like that. Interesting. Now, now let, let's, let's take a look at this, you know, like say. Depression versus anger. Okay. Interesting. You know, because there's a, what's happening here is a, a spiritual solution to this problem is being illustrated for us that I don't have to identify with this. And then I become free and my feelings of good, bad, or mediocre in terms of my body. I, I just, it's not connected to me. So it, it's not like I suffer because of it, but if I am connected to it, then I suffer. Am I, is my body good? Is it bad or is it mediocre? Well, right. it's mediocre right now if I could only get it up to good, but unfortunately sliding down into bad, you know, I'm suffering right. because of it, you know, so like, and in this day and age, it's so brutal because of media, right? And, and so, you know, so like there's this, people get it. People can see it that like we have all these super fashion models and supermodels and all this and, and this ideal kind of body is presented. And if my body isn't like that, well, then what's my worth? And then we suffer. And right. now, so, so then the, a material solution comes along. And, and I'm going to mention something about the material solution. And I'm not, I, I understand that the, the, um, the motive is good behind it. And I even understand that it can be valuable on a certain level. But what I want to try to illustrate is in the end, it doesn't actually accomplish nearly as much as the spiritual solution. And that is like, you, you take like women, they'll say like, you know, we've got this conception you need to be super thin. And yeah. so, and, and it's promoted through advertising. So then certain advertisers will say, okay, we're not going to play that game. You know, ultimately they're doing it because they think they can sell more this way. Right. But, but, right. But there may be <laughs> some good motive mixed into, and they're going to say, let's promote other shapes of bodies. Right. Right. That's a thing. Like the dove commercials. Is that what you mean? For instance, dove had a campaign like dove that, right. Where there's, we're, we're right. now, we're going to line up a group of women who, whose bodies aren't the typical model's body, right? right? They're heavier, you know, or let's change the terminology and let's not say chubby or fat, let's say like uh, curvy or something. Like that. Different, curvaceous, yeah. full, yeah. full figured. But, but what they do is they, they're still choosing women that like, although they're heavier, you know, their, their body weight and their shape is different than the average model, they're still like pretty. And, you know, smooth skin and, and, you know, pretty faces and, you, you know. Where, where are you going with this? Well, so my point is, is that there's still a bodily conception there. <laughs> They're still promoting women with a certain type of what's conceived of as beauty. And what if I'm not that? You know, it's all, and, and even, if I, even if I am thin and, and, and pretty, aid, you know, time is going to come along and take that away, you know? Yeah, yeah there's really, really no, yeah. yeah and men are tortured the in the same world, way. Un, the material world's unfair. The material world's unfair. <laughs> or it's too fair in one sense. But yeah, and, and men are going through the same thing, although, you know, it manifests in a different way. But men are, are insecure about, you know, about the, the shape of their body and the, the strength of their body. And, you know, and, the, and like you say, their hair or whatever it may be, they're also I, insecure. I think there's beauty privilege, Kostuba. Beautiful no- people get whatever they want. <laughs> you ever notice that? Beautiful but, people can get pulled over by a cop and just sort of like talk to the cop and all of a sudden they're free. There's a beauty privilege that's going on. And I think there should be some, some type of uh, payback for the rest of us. Tall people, same thing. Tall people get much more privilege than me as a short person. Okay. I'm, I'm joking. Every, I'm just saying everything's got a privilege. Everything's that, got a privilege. That is the, that's the nature of this world, okay? I know. Ex- externally, there's always this disparity. We we're reading about that last week. So my point is this, is that I can try to make a material adjustment, adjust, I can try to adjust my weight. 
I can try to adjust my beauty through, through makeup or plastic surgery, or I can try to adjust my strength through working out or doing this or doing that. I can try to make adjustments, but these, the, 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 the success of that adjustment is very limited. I can try to adjust my mental attitude towards and say, oh, I'm not fat, I'm curvy. I can, you know, I can try to adjust these things. And there'll be some very limited level of success in that, but there's a spiritual so- solution. Right. What's called divya jnana, spiritual knowledge. It's you know. so, Kustu, the material world is so unfair, and as you said, or exactly fair, whatever, however you want to put it. But it's like, every, there's musical, pri- I'm just going spinning this one. There's musical privilege. There is strength or athletic ability privilege. Like, I just couldn't keep up athletically with people in my school. I just couldn't do it. And then, and, and, and they get all the, they get all the worship. They get all the, they get the, they get all the high school accolades. I couldn't keep up with it. And there's like a privilege that's sort of like inborn in, 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 in different people in different facets of life. And I'm bitter about it. No, but it's easy to get bitter about it. Um, because especially if the whole world is pushing a, a form, a haircut, a body type, um, an ability um, and, and, and also there's probably those, those forms and fashions and stuff change probably um, over the decades, what it's, sure. what's sure. cool to look at and what's attractive to look at or what's a useful skill to have nowadays as opposed, you know, no one cares if you're expert at the bassoon, you know what I mean? But if you're great at the electric guitar, that's really cool. At one time to play the bassoon was really privileged. So that's always <laughs> okay. changing. Okay. It's not so cool to be a bassoon player anymore. Not anymore. It's not. You can't like hang that around your shoulder and look cool, like real low and like you're Johnny <laughs> Ramone or something like that with a bassoon. <laughs> it's not cool. But my, 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 my point is like, there's always going to be someone who's got a better privilege than me. And then I've always have some other privilege. And, um, and you know, the Yogi say it's all even, right? That we, it's some karma that we have. But the only way, the only way is to make that disconnection from the bodily conception. And I think if you've been a brahmachari or have lived or or, or a very internalized person, it is the beginning of that freedom. And I remember, I remember actually having it being a brahmachari and being that celibate student and living in India and feeling like I'm not in the game anymore. I'm not playing that game. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Where you yeah. just feel like I'm above it, witnessing it. It's almost like Krishna gives you this little glimpse, sort of seeing the movie trailer of what it's like to be a Paramahamsa. You get a glimpse into what it's be like. I'm not interested in the material world. I'm above it. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let my lower passions, my ch- lower chakras dominate my intelligence. And you actually, I remember this, I wrote it in my diary when I was in my early 20s. I was like, I am, I've become a free man. And of course, that was just a glimpse. It was, it's not my whole life, but, but it's, it's real. It's real. That's when you're yeah. actually beginning like the dawn of mukti or liberation. Yes, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Mukti, freedom, right? Freedom. Because free, once you're embodied, once I think I'm going to get my pleasure through her, or I'm getting my pleasure by uh, appeasing this group of people or they're, them thinking that I'm hot or attractive. Once you're in that consciousness at all, which is the whole material world, which is the mall, you know, which is everything everyone's trying to sell us. Once you're in that concept, you're in the matrix and you're setting yourself up for pain and pleasure. That's pain exactly. when you Pain when you checked all the boxes. Hair's good, body's good, abs are good, boobs are good, butt's good, my biceps are good, you know, whatever, whatever, my car is good. I've got all those things, but I have a crappy car. You know, it's the same thing. Am I driving the right thing? Right. It's, it's exhausting. Material world is exhausting. So playing the game sets you up for suffering. Yudhishthira yeah. is saying, I'm not going to play the game. And, and, and he's going through this process, right? So, so the idea is that Divya Jnana, spiritual knowledge, you see, I can try to adjust the material conditioning. My material conditioning tells me that this type of body is unattractive. I'm going to try to make a mental adjustment and say, no, no, it's attractive. Um, but, you know, a far more effective method is for us to, 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 it, it, to embrace spiritual knowledge and, and value people on the spiritual level. And then this way you can value everyone. Right. No, nobody's left behind this way. 
you know? Right. And it relieves you from suffering and it gives you the ability to move through this world and actually care for every living being, connect with every living being. If not, not only does it free one from the, the, one's own self judgment, right? Which can be the cause of so much pain and suffering, but it also gives you the ability to deal with others without being judgmental, right? To be able to associate with everyone on the spiritual level. And that, that, that's what deep spirituality really looks like is when you can move through this world and relate to people on that spiritual level. You know, Kasubji, I, I was just thinking how, um, you know, for, for, for all of us and for Maharaj Yudhisthira, it's a little more difficult to get it out of the matrix. One, we have family. I'm attached to my family. I'm attached to my home. What to speak of Yudhisthira is attached to his palace or his people or he, he, and his people love him, his citizens love him. But I was thinking as a monk, you get the perks. You get almost like a little, a little, um, a perk, a little perk. I guess perk's a good word. Perk, for example, for example, you don't have to shop for clothing anymore. You just wear robes, and it's not like check out my robe. It's like the same as the guy next to his robe. We're all in the same dumb robe. But think about how much pain that relieves you from not having to be like, what am I gonna wear today? Like that's exhausting. What am I gonna wear today? Like imagine, and, and what am I gonna what? I gotta go clothes shopping. You know when you when you know when a monk has to go clothes shopping? When their robe rips, that's when they have to go clothes shopping. You don't have to go clothes shopping. That is, it, it, and, and people like to shop, so it takes a little bit of pleasure away, but it also takes away a great amount of mental anguish. You know, there was also a period where, then you shave your head. And if you have, I mean, I already had short hair, so I didn't really get that perk, but if you were really into your hair, the shaving of your head is actually a freedom that you get. And then there's like the regulation of your diet. That's also, then there is the controlling of the pat, the lower chakras, their sexual organs. What, once you stop playing that game, you stop thinking, oh, how do I look for her? How do I look for him? How do I look? And you stop playing that. And it's, they're almost perks to help you get right out of the material world and that's one of the reasons I think that they say bhakti immediately does, what's that called? Klesh, kleshagni. It relieves kleshagni. all the fire of material. Ex, it, it, what, what's the English translation? It, it, it removes Well, the, it burns. Agni means like the fire. It burns up the kleshas. Um, yeah, all the pain of existence. Yeah. It, burn, it, it, it burns them out just to be in this world. So as monks, you get a little, you get a little perk like that. You get extra perks. A little perk. We're working hard just to, we're, we're but, working hard. But let's, let's understand Yudhishthira. You know, um, what happens in this section of the Bhagavatam is we see the, all that Yudhishthira went through. He was a person that embraced responsibility in life. Hmm. And, but it was full of difficulties and uh, it, it involved a lot of self-reflection and he felt responsible for a lot of problems in the world, but you know, he was advised, he got over it. He trained the next generation. All along, he's cultivating his spiritual life. Right. But he was waiting for that moment to live the life that you're just describing now, where I don't right. have to wear the royal garb. That's why, you know, these, these verses are just like, they're, they're all very important. It described that he took off his, royal robes and royal belt and royal ornaments and all that he was letting go of all. he just i don't want to have to think about this stuff anymore, <laughs> right it's just like, like was he attached was he attached to his royal belts well you know like i could imagine I it was a really nice which belt. Royal belt should i wear to it's probably a really nice belt <laughs> no but it's a fact you know the king's got a belt like it's like it's only the king's got a belt like that you know and, isn't it uh, cool how you would get unique pieces of clothing like now it's like, oh, give you me were just Levi's saying that you were just saying the opposite a minute ago. <laughs> well, now I'm diving into the material. <laughs> now I'm diving into the, the joy of materialism. <laughs> My own unique belt that no one else has. <laughs> Raganov's belt. Check that out. I've never seen a belt like that. Yeah. But so, but my point is this, is that it's, it's, it's okay that we try to create some material solutions to the material problems out there. That's fine. And, and they can play a role and, and they can help make some useful adjustments. But, but the true solution only comes on the spiritual level. Mm. 
right? So yeah. the Dove campaign, you know, okay, there's, there's a good intention behind that, but it's not going to solve the problem. The, the problems only get solved when we take it to that spiritual level. Because the material world is designed that way. It's designed to keep screwing up until you get your head straight, right? It's, you're you never, know what? I yeah. was never welcome in the basketball community. Oh, no. Because of my shortness. What and is that song? You know huge. that song? Who did that song? Short, pe short people. No, not yeah, short people. No, it was like a rap song. Anyway, I'm not. I I'm, wish I'm, I was I'm, a I'm, I'm trying to be serious. I'm, I'm being I'm serious. Be serious. It's exactly There's right on the point. There's a privilege that the tall people have that I didn't have. And well, to I'm be a basketball you. player in my school, that yeah. was like, you were the basketball player or the basketball player. Okay. You know what I mean? And I just couldn't jump. And I was short. And I was overlooked. And it hurt. And it, it's not fair. <laughs> Yeah, see, Bob and Matthews got it right here. I wish I was a little bit taller. I wish I was a baller. You were going through that. <laughs> I was going through that, and, and it's painful. And it's okay. it's, it's, it's pain. Material world's a painful place. Well, I think that whole song is about. I don't even know who does it. Maybe someone could show. I wish I was a little bit taller. I wish I was a baller. Yeah. So that's just a song. I wish I was this. I wish I was that. I wish. I, but when you on the spiritual level, you let go of all of that, right? <laughs> and, and yes. You're free. De La Soul. Oh, that's De La Soul. Okay. My friend was their producer, actually. You know Gingy? Gingy Brown? Yeah, Gingy? Gingy produced them? Yep. I don't know I that know song, that. but he was their producer. I know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. All right. Well, you want to hear something else? I grew I, <laughs> <laughs> what other? What else did you go? Let it all out, Robin. Why don't you I lie down with, right I, there? On I went to high school with DJ Dimitri from Delight. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to share something spiritual. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought we were just talking about weird things from the 80s. DJ Dimitri. Okay. <laughs> he was my punk buddy. Okay. Okay. So let's, anyway. let's continue with this commentary, okay? Yeah. So he says, Please. the qualitative distinction of the body as being good, bad, or mediocre is distinguished. And again, the qualitative manifestations become merged in the material energy which is produced from a false sense of the pure living being, right? We, we want to, I want to be the center. I want to be the enjoyer. I want to be God. That false sense of Dharma. No, no, no. We're the <clears throat> servant of God. And it's actually the most, it's the, it's the greatest pleasure. I actually want that role. Then the whole material generation starts. He says, when one is thus inclined to become an associate of the Supreme Lord, not the Supreme Lord himself, but become this, the personality of Godhead in one of the innumerable planets in the spiritual sky, especially in Goloka Vrindavan, one has to think always that he is different from the material energy. He has nothing to do with it. And he has to realize himself as pure spirit, Brahman, qualitatively equal with the supreme Brahman or God. Right, that so deep right there, right? This is what spirituality is all about. I'm not this body. I am Brahman. I am spiritual energy. I am made of the same energy as God. I don't need to be attached to whether my body is good, bad, or mediocre, right? I've got some temporary role to play. I'll play that role, but I'm going to cultivate this inner knowledge all along. And at a certain point in my life, I'm going to let go of it all and be 100% focused on this. Right, Maharaj, you just you know, go ahead. You know, I'm thinking, thinking of these, right I'm thinking yeah. basketball because I'm thinking these guys. It's like they didn't do anything to get these bodies. They didn't work hard for that. They just grow. They were born tall. It's like, their karma. Level the play. I know it's their karma, but it's sort of like everybody has to suffer because of that karma. You you grow. You talk, what about what about like make a whole league for shorter people? Make it fair, like like wrestling. You have different weight. Well, classes. you're doing exactly what I just class. advised. You're trying to make a material adjustment. Well, I'm that's what you, I'm saying. Well, that's what I'm, exactly, exactly. So that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to understand. See, for years I've been bitter. I thought they should have a shorter class of basketball players, and this is what the material world does. It tries to even out. Let's try to let's try to even out for the short guys. But the fact is, you're never going to have an evenness in the material world anyway. No matter. I'm bringing it full circle. You know what I'm okay. doing? I'm okay. having closure with closure. high school trauma. That's what's going on here right let's, now. Let, well, that's what I'm saying. Why don't you lie down on, on, on across the seats of your thing there and let it all out. 
Oh. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I've got to be detached. Okay. okay. If I want success in my spiritual life. Now let's continue with this commentary. Maharaj Yudhishthira, after distributing his kingdom to Parikit, his grandson, and Vajra, we read about that yesterday, or when, yeah, I think it was yesterday, did not think himself emperor of the world or head of the Kuru dynasty, right? He's not thinking that way anymore. No, whole new identity. Whole new identity. This sense of freedom from material relations, as well as freedom from material encagement of the gross and subtle encirclement, that means the body and the mind, yeah. makes one free to act as a servitor of the Lord, even though one is in the material world. Right? So I'm still got this body, I still got this mind, I'm still moving through this world, but I'm not identifying with it anymore. Now I'm free to actually love God, right? To become a servant of the Lord. Even though one is still in the material world. This stage is called Mara. Mara? You're in the material world, but you're liberated at the same time. She thought she was getting off easy today. Jivan this is lame. Mukti. Huh? Jivan Mukti? Boom. Ooh, that's Mara's pretty good. good. That's pretty good. good. This, is, this stage is called Jivan Mukta stage, or the liberated stage, even in the material world. That is the process of ending material existence. One must not only think, oh, this is really interesting, now Prabhupada takes it to the next level. You ready? Yeah. So there's, the, you could come, to the, first there's a stage I identify with the material body. Then we can get to the stage of Jivan Mukta where says, I'm not this body, I am spirit, and I'm free. Now, Prabhupada says, this is the process of ending material existence. One must not think that he, one must not only think that he is Brahman or spiritual energy, but yeah. one must act like Brahman. One who only thinks himself Brahman is an impersonalist. Wow. And one who acts like Brahman is the pure devotee. That is a great statement. Mm. Everything is behavior, huh? Well, yeah, but 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 the the idea is like, I realizing that I that I am not this body is halfway there. That means I'm not an illusion, but the full reality hasn't opened up to me yet. Right. But the full reality is that there's a whole realm of devotional love, not just freedom from material suffering, but devotional love, devotional engagement on a higher level. So the tendency is as we move through this world and we suffer, we want to become free from that suffering. We want to become liberated from that suffering. We want to realize that I'm not this body, I'm not this mind, and we want to attain a stage that's, that's, that's free of that, that attachment and the suffering that's attached to it. But that's just like the beginning. That's just now, now from that point, everything opens up to what's the spiritual reality. And the spiritual reality is a reality of relationship. It's a reality of devotion. It's a reality of love. And that's what Bhagavatam reveals very clearly where, where other texts, earlier texts, like say Upanishads, they're going to dwell more on becoming free from the material suffering. But Bhagavatam is going to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the spiritual reality that exists. And it's, and it's a reality of variety. It's a, it's a reality of relationship. It's a reality of love. So I think that that's what he means there. It's like, not just thinking, not just realizing I'm not this body, but then what do I do as a spirit? What's open, what opens up to me, you know, in the realms of, of devotional yoga, devotional um, love. Like that. And there you go. That's, that's the end of that commentary. You have any final thoughts to share on that, Raghu? No, we've got about two minutes left. Thinking myself spirit and living living and behaving in a spiritual way are two different things. That matter of fact, we can't even fully understand our spiritual self unless we're actually living it on a day-to-day -day basis. And when I say live it, it's our behavior. And behavior has to do with the way we treat ourselves and the way we treat other people. And then that, then that realization is not just, we're not just, uh, it's not just a t-shirt. I'm spiritual. I'm, I'm a spiritual person. T-shirt. It comes down to our day to day, um, the way we behave. Yeah, well, we. Have, 
Go ahead. We have, to, we have to take that vision off that material level. So not only do we not feel bad about ourselves, but that we see everyone equally. Some of the Darshan, mm. right? So yeah. that we, we're not ba- we're not judging people. And truthfully, it's it's the so real right. equal. It's the real equality. It's the ultimate it's solution to all the problems: racism, it's the misogyny, real, it, all different kind of mental uh, pain. Species, et cetera, et cetera. speciesism, nationalism, yeah. it, it, every, all the isms. Right. It actually breaks it down to what we actually have all, what we all have in common, and how we are all connected, and how we're all leaves on a on a bigger tree. All right. Uh, Thank you. Because uh, on that material, uh, yeah. what's where's where's DJ Mara? <laughs> I'm sitting, <laughs> DJ Mara. I thought you could be on this with a headphone on, one ear bouncing your head up, give you a chance here to to like uh, rock it. Here she is. Here. There you go. Okay, Can you hear it? Is that how janky it sounds when I play it every day? <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.